Systemic racism is at the root of vulnerabilities of climate change. It's not, it's not just inflating climate change. Um, we're seeing systemic racism in action right now, and there are multiple examples, but you could go back to things like redlining neighborhoods, which is when, you know, uh, the institutions, especially banks, would literally draw red lines around certain neighborhoods, which tended to be people of color, uh, especially black neighborhoods, and say, we're not going to give these people loans, right? And we're going to force poverty on these people. And with environment, we oftentimes also look at the development around these neighborhoods where they would put interstates right in the middle of these neighborhoods that cut off these neighborhoods, oftentimes from access to many things they needed. If you get a lot of rain, right, in, in a lot of cities, that, that rainwater, it goes somewhere in the drains, right? In a lot of cities, that is mixed with sewage water. So when it rains a lot and the systems can't handle that, it's just too much water that's going into the drains and all, all the sewage backs up onto streets into waterways, into parks. It's toxic, it, it, it'll make you gag just to smell it, not to mention very, very horrible for you to breathe. And uh, look no further than New York City. Well, where, where does it back up? It's in all of the poor neighborhoods that were once uh, redlined right in those districts. Um, so they're still feeling the effects of that. You see black farmers who were refused loans for decades and decades and decades and decades. Um, and even those that try to make it work, we had their land taken from them. So some of the land they own isn't very good land, Native American tribes, we see that as well. So that, that becomes part of, of food security. You know, I think some systemic racism, it's rooted in everything that we talk about. So even when we're talking about, well, everybody just needs to be part of the decision-making process. Because of systemic racism, we've ensured that certain folks uh, stay impoverished, and those same people do not have time to show up to community events or to public meetings that might last three to four hours. And maybe it's the last thing on their priority list when they're worried about getting food on the table or you know, making sure their kids have a good education or, or you know, a roof over their heads. Structural racism and its creation, its absolute creation of haves and have-nots in poverty, to this day, keep those people out of decision-making. There are cities, for example, like Providence, Rhode Island, um, who did develop, there was the first city to develop a climate justice plan for a city. And it is pretty amazing that Providence, Rhode Island was the first to do that. And they did, they actually, they got all local stakeholders. They, they helped uh, with daycare in case those local stakeholders had kids and they didn't know, you know, they, they need somebody to watch their kids. And they don't just talk about climate. They bring in these different groups of people. They bring in the actual stakeholders and they talk about housing and they talk about transportation, and they talk about education, and they talk about all these things as they relate to climate, which might be one small way uh, of trying to bring folks that have on purpose been left out of the decision-making to try to bring them back into the decision-making.